my good and your mercy endure it forever. People from every nation and time, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you. Good and your mercy endure it forever. Oh, come on and sing with all your heart. Lord, you are good. And your mercy endure it forever. For people from every nation.
I'm good all the time and all the time you are good you are good all the time yes for all the time you are just singing 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 with all of your heart you are good all the time all the time even when I don't feel it even when I don't see it you are good you are good you are good you are good You're so good and your mercy endures forever, oh God. And we worship you this morning. You are good, yes, Lord. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Let's sing together, faithful.
to you, God. Thank you for your promises, Lord. Oh, Father, each and every promise of yours is yes and amen. And we worship you this morning for who you are. You are the promise keeper. You are the way maker. And we worship you, Jesus. In your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises, my confidence is that you're faithful.
Just worship him right now out of his nature. Jesus, you are the healer. You are the great restorer. You are the great redeemer. You are the great way maker, God, and we can search our whole lives, but we will not find one like you. There are none like you. Father, this morning we have come to worship you in spirit and in truth, and we have come to declare, God, that for us there are no others. There is one. And Jesus, we ask for your hand to be over our families in this season, to be over our lives in this season of uncertainty. Lord, we know that you are only certain. You are the rock of ages. You never change.
church this morning, um, just in this atmosphere as we're remaining in prayer and worship. Uh, it's on our heart to do a couple prayers. And uh, one of the first prayers we want to do right now is pray um, for the West Coast. Uh, pray for the first responders. Pray for all the fire departments. Pray for all the families that are affected. Uh, I don't know how, how close everyone is connected to the news, but there is a... Um, a tragic amount of fires in the West Coast. I have some friends in Oregon which they are being evacuated out of um, out of their homes because of the fires that are happening in the West Coast. Um, and even some of our church members uh, up in Bonnie Lake, they're being threatened now. Um, so let's just take a couple minutes and raise our hands and, and pray over the West Coast. Pray over every family that is affected. Uh, pray over every first responder. Pray for God's hand and, and God's wisdom and God's power just to be in our leaders, in our government, in our first responders, um, and everyone that is that is affected by this and is fighting this. Jesus, right now, we just take and we place the West Coast in your hands. We pray for your mercy, for your grace, for your wisdom, for your power to be over this nation. Lord, and we pray for every single first responder, Lord, that you would give strength to their families, you give comfort to their families as they're working long hours, Lord. And Lord, we just declare that your kingdom will be established in the West Coast. It doesn't matter what happens or what circumstances may be happening, Lord, your hand will be over them. So Lord, as your word says that where two or three are in agreement, so you are there. So this morning, Lord, we come in agreement for your hand to come and touch the West Coast. In Jesus' mighty name. Uh, another prayer that we want to do this morning um, is it's September and uh, school season is upon us. Uh, and though this year there are unique circumstances, many of our students are going back to schools. Um, so I just want to invite um, every student. So if you're preschool, elementary school, what are, what are they, middle school, junior high, high school, community college, real college, trade school, construction school, uh, driver's ed school, I don't, whatever school you're in, um, I want to invite you forward. Uh, we want to pray for every single um, student that is going back to school. So do we have any? We have a couple. Just two. Any more students? Come on, let's welcome them to the front. We love our students. Uh, we just want to pray that God's hand of protection will be over you guys. Also pray for a supernatural impartation of mercy and patience on your parents because many of you guys are going to be staying in school at home doing online work so new circumstances for any you know many may say today um why send kids back to school it's it's such a crazy time it's such an uncertain time you know stay home let's wait till next year um, but i want to read the verse um this is actually the verse of our church and it's matthew 5 14 it says that you are the light of the world you are a city that is set on a hill. It cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see the good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. So you are needed in this time. Many people may say, stay safe, but you are needed because we cannot place our, our light under a lampstand. We must go and be a city on a hill, the light of the world. So let's just stretch our hands right now towards all our students and um, everyone that's going back to school right now. Father, right now we just lift up all our, all our preschoolers, elementary school, high schoolers, middle schools, colleges, Lord, for all these students that are going back into, the, into schools, whether it's on campus or online, Lord, that your provision, your wisdom, and your anointing will guide them, Lord. And even in just uncertain times of, of different challenges that they may be facing this year, Lord, we pray that your hand will guide them, Lord. And maybe they might not have all the knowledge, God, but your spirit is upon them. Your spirit will lead them and your spirit will direct them, Lord. And I just pray for every single student in this place, Lord, that they're going to be lights, that they're going to be salt in, on their campuses in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. And Lord, you, we know that you haven't stopped moving even in this season. So you're going to move through them in their schools. You're going to move through them in, in their communities. In Jesus' name, 
we just place them into your hands. Amen. You guys may be seated. Come on, let's give it up for all our students, our worship team. Can I get the, the pulpit? Thank you so much, worship team. Amazing being back with you guys. Um, I just have a couple announcements um, and also offering if ushers are ready. Um, I w yeah, you guys can come on, come on up. This morning we're going to collect our offering. Uh, I want to read just a verse, uh, a couple verses from 2 Corinthians 8. Um, it's Apostle Paul's message to the church in Corinth. Um, verse 1, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1. He says, now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God and His kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they have not gave only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it of their free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift of the believers in Jerusalem. This is a very interesting passage which Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. He says, though this church in Corinth, uh, sorry, this church in Macedonia is going through many struggles and many, and many trials, he says they are rich because of their generosity. It's such an interesting contrast that he says they are rich, though they have nothing, they are rich because of generosity. Generosity makes us rich, friends. Uh, it, it's almost like it contradicts itself. How can you give if you're poor? But they're saying, even though in the midst of all their trials, they are rich because of generosity. And uh, Apostle Paul is saying that this church in Macedonia has figured out this principle of true joy that is found through generosity, that they are begging us if they could even give to the church that we're blessing in, in Jerusalem. So what, what a church that we see in Macedonia. That they're poor, but they're begging Apostle Paul and they're saying, Apostle Paul, are there any other needs that we can we could tend to? Are there any other needs that we can give to? He's, he's literally saying, they're begging to be part of the other work that we're doing. Um, so this is just, I believe, the heart that we have in the Kingdom of God that, that God is our provider and um, you know, although in these uncertain seasons, I believe that generosity is still the way forward. And so um, I just want to challenge us and exhort us in that. We have five different ways to give. One of the ways is in person and also online through our app and stuff like that. So we just bless you in that. And uh, also I have an announcement um, for all our youth, youth um, kind of ages 16 to 20, 20-ish, 20 20-something. We are having a combined service, combined special service this next Friday at South Campus. Um, and it's gonna be minist ministering there is gonna be Pastor Dima's niece, yeah, yeah, whatever, something like that. Pastor Dima's relative, uh, Ilona Panesuk. Uh, she was from the East Coast. She was up here, uh, if you remember, up in July. So she's gonna be joining the South Campus youth service. And we're gonna drive up there and we're gonna have a special night up there. So I wanna encourage you if you're youth, um, let's plan a carpool this week up there, down there. Parents, make sure your, 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 your kids are involved. And um, with that, I want to invite Ben. He's going to be sharing the word this morning. So let's, let's welcome him. Church, God is good. <laughs> you know, I love the song we sang this morning because it's like Artem was training us to do that. So God is good, and all the time. Oh man, praise God, it's good to be in the house of God, amen? Like, you know, you look around at what's going on in the news, and man, 2020 has been quite a year, huh? <laughs> and to add insult to injury, now we have all this smoke outside. Uh, but we're in church, praise God. <clears throat> you know, I actually, um, I really like the point that was made by this song, right? We sort of kept repeating that God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. And it's an important point because we understand we as children of God, we, uh, we rely on God's provision. We rely on God's um, providence to guide us through life. 
And sometimes it might seem like what God is doing isn't especially good, you know? It's like, Lord, maybe, maybe this is better right here, you know, how about, how about this? But God is good, and it's good for us to proclaim that this morning. It's a joy for me to be sharing with you the Word of God uh, this morning, folks. I believe that the Bible is the living Word of, the inspired Word of the living God, and that everything that we need for God the living is found in Scripture. And this morning, I want us to take a look at what the Bible says, what the Bible tells us about sacrifice. <clears throat> sacrifice is found a lot in the Bible. And the Bible talks a lot about sacrifice, and we know that the children of Israel, they were commanded to sacrifice. They were commanded to bring sacrifices. And they would bring animal sacrifices, they'd bring lambs, uh, lamb and goats, and um, and pigeons and turtle doves and th those sorts of things. And actually, there's a rather good chunk of the Old Testament that is devoted to outlining exactly how these sacrifices are supposed to be brought. And if you've read the Bible, you've come across this word sacrifice a lot. Right? The word sacrifice is used in the Bible 300 times. And its synonym, the word offering, is used over 700 times. And so if you, as you read the Bible, you know, maybe sometimes you like, okay, I'm going to start from the beginning, you start reading, and then you get into the book of Leviticus, and everything there is about sacrifice, and it's about how you got to bring this sacrifice and that sacrifice. And you're like, man, there's so much sacrifice here. But the Bible talks a lot about sacrifice. But not only the Bible, I think also there is something native to humans when it comes to sacrifice. There's something innate in us that wants to sacrifice. We read that the very first people, the, some of the first people in the Bible... Uh, that ever lived, they brought sacrifices to God before God even commanded. You know, when Noah got off the ark, he brought a sacrifice. And actually, the Bible says that he brought an animal that was, brought animals that were ritually clean. And uh, this was before the law of Moses was given. This was before God had instituted sacrifices. So it seems to suggest that there was a practice of bringing sacrifices to God. There's something about us that wants to sacrifice. Now we understand that we as, <clears throat> we as Christians living in the New Testament, we don't really talk about, a whole lot about sacrifice. Because we understand that's sort of an Old Testament fixture, right? It's something that the children of Israel would do. Uh, that's, that's something that was abolished when Jesus Christ came and gave himself as a sacrifice. Right, that's sort of, sort of how we frame and how we think about sacrifice. And so a lot of our messaging today is focused not on sacrifice, but on just living the faith, right? And just, just living uh, as God has commanded us. And we have, uh, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of our messaging is focused on what God has done for us. And the Christian message is correct in saying that Jesus came and he gave the ultimate sacrifice. Right? Jesus came and he brought the sacrifice that ended all sacrifices. But folks, I want to tell you this morning that God still desires a sacrifice. And the Christian life that we are invited to live, the Christian heart that we are invited to, that we are called to adopt is one of sacrifice. You know, as we read scripture, we see that there are places where God is displeased with people how they bring sacrifice. God is displeased how some people bring sacrifice, and he says, like, I don't like your sacrifices, right? I, in some places, God says, I desire mercy instead of sacrifices. In other places, God says that I, I want obedience more than I want sacrifice. And folks, I think that sometimes we can look at these scriptures and we can think that, you know what, God is done with sacrifices. God doesn't want sacrifices anymore. He doesn't want us to offer anything. God, Jesus has come. He's done everything. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that we can bring. And so we just, we just need to chill, right? We just need to kind of sort of hang out and let Jesus take care of business. But folks, I think as we read scripture, we see that God desires to see a sacrifice from us. You know, sacrifice, it is a loss. Sacrifice is a it is a cost. There is a cost associated with sacrifice. I really like the, uh, the, the story in King David's life when, it's towards the end of his life when King David decided he's going to count the people of Israel. I don't know, maybe it was just an ego trip or something. He decided he wanted, wanted to see just how big his armies were. And this displeased God. And so God is punishing the land and God is commanding David to bring his sacrifice. 
And so God tells David to go to this particular, there's this man in the, in the Bible with the name of Aruna, and God tells him to go offer a sacrifice on the threshing floor of Aruna. And so David comes down, and David comes to Aruna, and Aruna's, you know, like being nice, to, you know, he's being uh, uh, respectful and honoring the king, and he's bowing down. And, the, and uh, he asks the king, he says, what do, you, like, what, what do you need? Like, what's going on? Why are you here, right? Like, I'm just a, a lowly man. And David says, I need to offer a sacrifice on your threshing floor. And I want to read a couple of these verses because I think they're very important. They highlight sort of what I'm trying to talk about this morning. Verse 22 of 2 Samuel chapter 24. <clears throat> Verse 22 says, Aruna said to David, let my Lord the king take and offer up what is good in his sight. Look, the oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing sledges, and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. Everything, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. However, the king said to Aruna, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. You know, maybe you've read the story, maybe it's never particularly spoken to you, but I think we see here that David understands what true sacrifice means. He understands that sacrifice, it comes with a cost. That you cannot sacrifice without, without incurring a cost. It cannot, it, it cannot be something that costs you nothing. By definition, it's not a sacrifice. Right? And so, what do you think? What do you think would have happened if David would have just accepted the man's offer? I mean, God didn't command David to buy the thing, buy the, the place from him. He just told him to offer an offering in the place. Right? But a better question is, what would we have done in David's place? Us New Testament Christians who understand that sort of Jesus has paid it all and we just kind of have to accept the free gift. Folks, this morning I want to kind of point out that our messaging as Christians has become so focused on what God has done for us on what God has given us and what God has, has given all these, these promises, right? And he's given us all this power and God is for you and he's not against you and all these things. But we forget that scripture is primarily about sacrifice. And we, even in the New Testament, are not excluded from being called to sacrifice. You know, when we read scripture, we can see that we as Christians, we are called to forfeit even that which we are owed. I know it's not necessarily a popular message because perhaps you'd rather hear just about how God is, you know, has given us all things. And, but when we read scripture, we can see that Christians live a life of sacrifice. Let's look at the life of Paul for a second. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he gives us a little taste of his Christian life, right? He, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, he says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane, I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number. And this, this is Paul describing what it means to be a Christian. Right? Paul, what about walking in power? What about the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in me? What about us being seated in the high places, right? In the heavenly places. It says, five times I received from the Jews, 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, in the wilderness, on the sea, dangers amongst false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger. And you know what? You can just read down to verse 28. But the point is that his life was pretty terrible. Right? Because we sort of, we sort of accepted the notion that when we come to God, God is just gonna, he's gonna fix all our problems. He's gonna do everything for us. He's gonna take care of business for us. And God is going to help sort of open up the potential that we have inside of us. Right? God is sort of concerned about how we're going to do. But folks, I want to tell you that Paul here gives us a slightly different description of what it means to be a servant of Christ. It is a life marked with sacrifice. Paul actually says, this, says there are things that I'm entitled to, but for the sake of Christ, I will give it up. In verse 30, he, kind of, he brings his argument to a point. 
He says, if I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. Man, that is a hard statement because this is the same Paul that writes to us about all the various promises that we have. He tells us about all the wonderful things that God has done for us. But I think what he's showing us with his life is that yes, these promises are yes and amen. And God is not unfaithful to his word. He will fulfill all the promises he's made over your life. But what God is trying to say is that, uh, sorry, what Paul is trying to say is that the focus is not on what we can get from God. The focus is on us laying down ourselves. Us bringing a sacrifice to God. There is a feeling of self-abasement, of self-rejection. Right? It's not about what God can do for you. It's not what about, it's not about you know, the, the, the five things that God has promised you. It's a, it's a life of self-sacrifice that Paul is preaching. His focus is on Christ, not himself. His focus is on what he can give to Christ. He's not trying to preserve his reputation or image or some level of comfort in his life. He's willing to sacrifice it all for the sake of Christ. He says that no longer I live, but Christ in me. And we can look at the lives of all the other apostles and they have... They live similar lives. All of them except for one, they died as martyrs. Man, that is the pinnacle of being, of being a follower of Christ, right? Being apostle is sort of the highest calling. And we see, you know, as they start their epistles, a lot of them say, you know, Paul or James or John or Jude, an apostle, you know, a great preacher, just, you know, anointed of God. No, they say a slave, they say a slave. And folks, as we read scripture, as we read the New Testament, we see that the early Christians, their life was a life of sacrifice. Right? Sacrifice is a forfeiture of something that is yours. It's not an exchange. It's not something where you come to God and say, Lord, I'm going to believe in you if you give me these things. Right? It's not that I'm going to sort of accept Christianity because it seems to benefit me. God is not a utility. He's not something just to be used to get something for. Sacrifice is a giving up, it's a cost. The very heart of following Jesus is the sacrifice of the self. Jesus said, whoever wants to follow me must deny himself, must give himself up. It's not, it's, it's not about like I come to Jesus and you know, Jesus is going to, he's gonna wash away my sins and he's going to make me, uh, he's gonna raise me up and he's gonna make me the best me that I can be. That will happen, folks. But the focus, our focus should be on coming to Christ and denying ourselves, sacrificing yourself. That is what we as Christians are called to. And the essence of Christianity is to be preoccupied with things that are not ourself. Not trying to receive all these things for yourself. But I, but I repeat myself. Second Chronicles 16 says that the eyes of the Lord, they're darting to and fro throughout the whole earth. You know, he is looking for people who are fully, who are fully committed to him, fully devoted to him. And what it means to be devoted, what it means to be committed, it means to fully sacrifice yourself, fully bring yourself as a sacrifice to God. See, the focus is not on the self. The focus is on the lowering of the self. It's on the denying of the self. And Jesus himself warns against um, warns against trying to preserve the self, right? He says that whoever, whoever wants to save his life, whoever is gonna be concerned with trying to sort of get something for yourself, right? Like, yeah, I know I'm kind of giving everything to God, but also I kind of wanna, <laughs> you know, I kind of wanna get some good things for myself. I kind of wanna be blessed by God. Jesus says whoever does that, he will lose it all. You cannot, we, we cannot as Christians live a duplicitous life where we are on the one hand wanting to sacrifice to God, but on the other hand, we want to sort of preserve ourself. Jesus calls us to deny ourselves fully, to give ourselves fully over to him. God cannot be sought after for the sake of receiving just his blessing. He must be pursued for his own sake. Folks, and this is my message this morning. My message this morning is, is pretty simple that we as Christians are called to sacrifice. You know, that we are called to 
have a posture that is focused away from ourselves. And un unfortunately, we don't speak a whole lot about sacrifice today because we've sort of relegated sacrifice to the Old Testament. And I think a lot of our problems today have to do with our inability to allow God to rule our lives. We have so many problems when we come to God and we say, Lord, I want you to take care of this problem and I want you to do this. But then we don't give God control. Then we don't give God the space in our heart to do the work that he wants to do. You know, the, throughout the scripture, we read that people who are called Christians, they're called to be slaves of Christ. That's not a, that's not a very popular word today, <laughs> right? There's a lot of negative connotation for good reason, of course. But we are called to give up our will for the will of God to reign in our lives. You know, when Jesus, when, when we get saved, we proclaim that Jesus is the Lord of our lives, right? And so, so my message is, is really simple, that, the, that we should be sacrificers, that we need to bring a sacrifice to God. And not, not an animal sacrifice, of course, that's not what I'm speaking about. I'm talking about having a heart that is going to be sacrificial before God. A heart that is willing to give itself up for God fully. I think that is what God calls us to do. And that is what we see uh, in Scripture. I'll give you another example from Hebrews chapter 11 and then we can move on to another point. Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of faith, as it were. And it's where the author of Hebrews is talking about all the various great men of faith. And as he's talking about about Noah and Gideon and, and all these people that God had mighty moves through. You know, as he's talking about, like, by faith, they shut up the mouths of lions. By faith, they brought down fire from heaven and they, they won great victories. It's like, man, this guy's like, he's pumping it up, right? Let's go. Like, he's just telling us, this is what the Christian life is about, you know? Like, I'm ready to slay some giants. Come on. But then he turns all of it on his head in verse 35. He says, but others were tortured. Whoa. Oh. Oh man, I thought we were talking about victory. I thought we were talking about like, man, we're going to just do these powerful things for God. It says, they were not accepting their release that they might obtain a better resurrection. That others experienced mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were beaten to death. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. <laughs> you know, when I read this kind of Christianity, that's, I mean, my gut instinct, my flesh tells me that's not what I want. You know, that's, I want to stay away from that. I want that first part. I want the part where God is moving through me, right? Where God is giving me all these promises, where God is going to bring fire from heaven. He's going to just wipe out the mountains because he's but that's not what the faith is about. Yes, God does move in our faith and he moves in, in power when we do that, right? And that is, that is great when he does. But then there's also the side of, there's also so many people that have gone through history that have never received the promises, right? Verse 39 says, and all these having gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised. Does that mean their faith was, was not real? Does that mean that they weren't Christians? If they didn't see the powerful move of God who, uh, who would stop the mouths of lions, who would, you know, win wars with 300 people. That was the original 300, by the way, with Gideon, right? He would win wars with, with so little people. He would have so many great moves. And we look at that, we say, that is a result of their faith. It is. But then people who never saw this, people who went through so much hardships, people who would suffer so much for God and never receive what was promised to them. That is also faith. And so folks, I start to see that the, the, the picture we see in scripture is not one that like, you know, God is gonna give you all these things and he's just gonna punch through every wall for you. God might do that. And I pray that he does. And I pray that he does in my life too. <laughs> Let's be real. But what God calls us to is a life of sacrifice. Is a life willing, willing to accept whatever he gives. Maybe some of us will have to go through some of these things. I pray to God we don't. But if our heart is sacrificed to God, if our heart belongs wholly to him, 
fully to him, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that we don't see amazing, amazing works of God. I pray that we do. I pray that we receive here, even on earth, in our lives, what God has promised us. But my message this morning is that our focus, as Christians, as a church, our focus is not on our own lives, on wanting to see these things, on just pursuing God's blessing, on pursuing just God giving us all these things. Our focus as Christians needs to be on denying yourselves, on laying yourselves down for God. I remember there was, there was a uh, sermon some time ago that Pastor Vasily preached about giving up your rights. I don't know if uh, any of you remember this. But his point was that, you know, we as Christians, we are entitled to certain things. We have certain things that God has promised us. But the true appropriate Christian perspective is one of, is one of giving up the things that we are even owed. I feel like Apostle Paul had earned some, uh, some particular position in the church. I mean, he was the guy who preached to the Gentiles. He wrote, you know, the, the majority of our New Testament is written by Paul. But yet when he starts his epistles, he says, I am a slave, right? He says, I live this life of sacrificing these things, you know, instead of him being driven around on the fanciest, I guess it would be a cart those days instead of, you know, private jet like we have these days, right? Instead of him just having like just a busy schedule preaching at all the churches, he spent so much time sacrificing himself because that's what he was about, he wasn't about just wanting to realize himself to open up his potential. He was about sacrificing to God. Uh, I apologize if this is a gloomy message this morning. <laughs> and I don't mean it to be because, yes, God's promises are real. They are true. They are yes and amen over our lives. But we are called to live a life of sacrifice. And the reason... The reason is because he sacrificed first. Jesus was the original sacrifice. And he didn't do so in exchange. It wasn't a trade. As if we could have some, as we could give him, as if we could give him something in return for what he did. It wasn't a trade. There was no trade. There was, there was nothing that God could give, get from us that would enrich him but he sacrificed anyways. He came and he showed us what it means, what it means to sacrifice. The Bible says that Jesus, although he was God, although he was in the form of God, he did not consider it a thing to be grasped. And folks, maybe this is a message to some of us, although we are Christians, although we are, yes, we're children of God, we are part of the royal priesthood and, and all these things, maybe that's not a thing to be grasped. Maybe that's not a thing for us to just try to like, no, this is what I am, I'm gonna try to, it says instead he emptied himself. He took on the form of a slave. He humbled himself to death on the cross. And this is the same image of Jesus that we see in the lives of the apostles. You know, Jesus says, I call you friends. I call you friends. He says, no longer are you my, are my disciples. You are now my friends. So how come did none of the disciples, when they started their epistles, say, this is Paul, an apostle, a friend of Jesus? He says, I am a slave. And so we see, this, we see this idea, this notion of a sacrifice, that although these people have been called friends of Christ, that is, they don't consider that something to be grasped. Instead, they bow their hearts. They, they, they sacrifice even the things that they are owed. And this is shown to us by the life of Jesus. Romans tells us that while we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, he came and died for us. We could never pay him back. We could never repay him for the sacrifice he did. And God sacrificed too much for us to only give a part of ourselves to him. Jesus' sacrifice was too great to just have a part of you, folks. He came and he gave everything. And that is why he is in full right to demand that we deny ourselves fully as well. That is why we are called to live a life of sacrifice because he came and he sacrificed first. He showed us the example of, of, of how we are to relate to God. He came and he sacrificed even, even the greatest things that he had. And the apostles showed us 
in their lives as well. And we can read countless stories of, of people in the Old Testament and the New Testament that sacrificed. And folks, I just want to return and reiterate my main point. That we as Christians, we are called to live a life of sacrifice. And I know it's difficult for us in, in a society that is all about aggrandizing the self. It's all about fulfilling the desires of the self. Man, our advertisement industry is amazing at that. We're so good at showing, like, you deserve this. You should do this. Like, this is for you, right? This is going to make your life so much better. And somehow we are being turned to thinking about ourselves. And we're just like, just, we start to look at things through how they can benefit our life. We have a utilitarian view of the world. But the, this message of, of Jesus, it is radical in that it's not about what you can get. It's not about, it's completely away from you. It's a complete denial of the self. And that is why I think it is so potent because it is against everything that is, that is natural to us. It is against every natural fleshly instinct that we have. Jesus is our example. He was willing to give it all up for our sake. And I think because he did that, we should be willing to give it all up for his sake. Maybe God won't call you to sacrifice everything. Maybe God, God is not calling you to sell all your possessions uh, and you know, just give everything to some mission somewhere. But maybe, maybe we can sacrifice a little more than we have been up to this point. Maybe we can take that, those precious few moments in the morning where we are maybe at our sharpest or whenever that time is for you. And instead of spending it on, on things that are aside from God, maybe instead we can bring that as a sacrifice to God. Maybe, maybe when the going gets tough and the church isn't allowed to worship, maybe we are called to sacrifice some comfort, some convenience. Folks, maybe by now you've heard about the Let Us Worship movement, about Sean Feucht, is that his name? Feucht, Feucht, I think it's Feucht. Right? These, there, there are a couple guys that just decided that, you know what, we're tired of not, of not being allowed to worship. We're tired of not being able to worship in the church. So they decided to sacrifice their comfort, their convenience. They grabbed some instrument, instruments, they went outside, and they just played worship. And if they've been twice to Seattle, and if you've been there, you've seen just how, just how amazing, how intense the presence of God is in those, in those places. But these people, they understand that there is some violent people that want to do them harm. They understand that there are government officials that want to close down these, these gatherings. But they are willing to sacrifice. They're willing to take a risk being in danger from violent people or from the law. They are bringing a sacrifice and God honors a sacrifice. And this is my last point and we'll be closing is that God honors sacrifice. God sees, God knows. And to God, it's very near to his heart because he was the one who sacrificed. He was the original sacrificer. You know, Jesus, he saw when the woman brought only two pennies. And to some people, it was sort of worthless. Like, it's two pennies, what are you doing? It's almost like if you drop, you know, 50 cents in the, uh, in, in the bucket. It's like, oh, that's, that's cute, you know? <laughs> but Jesus knew the sacrifice he knew the sacrifice that was associated with that. And I think that Jesus, he understands, he sees a heart that is sacrificial towards him. That is why, that is why when David came, you know, it, it's, it's not that he thought, okay, I have to appease God somehow. It's because his heart was fully sacrificed to God. He knew that he cannot just come to God without, without, giving, without giving himself. And that is also why Abraham, when he was called to bring a sacrifice, his son, right? He did not withhold that. He did not say, Lord, but this is your promise. This is something you gave me. This is something that was like you'd been telling me about for 25 years. And now I finally have this son and you're asking me to sacrifice. No, this can't be you. Lord, this cannot be you. But it is a heart of sacrifice that Abraham had that made him willing to take even that which God has promised him, which was rightfully his. It was his. I mean, God had promised it to him. But he says, Lord, even this I am willing to give for you. <sighs> Folks, let's stand. Now, I want to encourage us to cultivate a heart of sacrifice. We love to read of the promises of God. And 
they are reassuring to our soul. And that's what they're there for. They're left there so that we can be certain that God, that God is for us, that God loves us. That he went so far as to give his son to die for us, right? So that he could be with us. And that is, the, that is the beautiful message of the gospel, that God loved us so much that he was willing to give, he was willing to sacrifice. And that is why this morning I invite us to, to have the same attitude towards God. To not just be users of God's grace, to not just want to receive from God what we can because, because we're concerned about our life. But instead to lay it all down at his feet and say, Lord, I am yours. I am yours. Romans 12 calls us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And the word there is be presenting. It's something that we continually do. If God who sacrificed so much loves us and is willing to die for us, how can we hold back any part of ourselves? Father, this morning we just want to come and, and say that we are yours. Lord, we thank you for all the wonderful things that you have done for us, God, that you have given us, Lord, for all the wonderful promises that you left in your word for us. God, we thank you, Lord. We are truly humbled and overwhelmed by the fact that you would give so much to be with such wretched people like us. God, this morning we pray that you would soften our hearts, Lord, that we, would, that we would look at your example, Lord, and that we in turn would also be sacrificers for you. God, that we would live life that is, that is fully abandoned for your sake, God, that we would live a life that is given fully to you, Lord, that we would not be preoccupied with ourselves, with trying to realize our own potential, Lord, with trying to make our own lives better, Father, but to give it all for you it all on the altar, Lord, to just present ourselves to you. Even when I don't see you work, even when I don't feel it, you working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working.
Jesus name we pray amen amen church you are dismissed see you next Sunday